Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Facebook Live. Uh, you know, sometimes you get the opportunity to have guests on that are really true uh, long term friends. And I do have that opportunity today uh, to introduce Pete Cervoni, a good friend of mine. We go way back. <laughs> How many years ago was that? Like 15 years, maybe? Right. Uh, 1999. Wow. 19 oh, over 20 years. Yeah. Wow. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and and one of the few few vegans I knew back in those days. And uh, uh, Pete's been uh, vegan for 23 years. We actually share the same vegan anniversary day, March 15th. So we both came became vegan. Different years. 35 years for me. 23 for for Pete. But. Pete and I met uh, a long time ago when uh, I was uh, working with some owners to open up a place called Suzanne's Vegetarian Bistro in North Miami Beach. It was one of the first um, of its kind in North Miami Beach. Actually, I think it was the first organic vegan restaurant um, in North Miami Beach. Right. So really excited to do that. Um, uh, we brought uh, Pete in and... Um, and we connected immediately, and uh, it's been a great friendship ever since then. Pete uh, was at the time with uh, Angelica's Kitchen, correct? Yep. Um, and then has gone on with many other uh, restaurants, vegan restaurants. You did some work with actually omnivore restaurants, veganizing them. And yep. I thought that was amazing. I was so excited to see you do that, really turning the light bulb on for some of these people. Right. And um, so a really a long and storied path. So I'm going to let you share your story from your point of view, because it's an amazing ride. <laughs> right. It, it really has been. And thank you for, for having me on here. And I, I'm, you know, I was thinking about this when, you know, before when I was like, consider, you know, thinking about coming on to the show today. And it's like, if when we met in 1999, I don't think we had any idea that we'd be sitting here now <laughs> no. with, with just the, the success of plant-based and veganism. Yes. Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing um, because it was difficult back then. When we met, it was right. like, I mean, I mean, we certainly vibed. I, I think we would have been friends regardless of that shared experience of being vegan. But I think, you know, I, I came down there with my buddy, Mike Perrine, who hopefully yes. is, you know, in fact, I got his t-shirt on today. Um, <laughs> And, you know, just to find like another cool dude who was like also vegan, it was like, boom, we're, you know, we're, we're on the same, we're on the same wavelength. Um, so, so much has changed, you know, um, and it's been, it's been an amazing, it's been an amazing ride. And I, you know, <clears throat> certainly don't have any regrets. I mean, I think both of our lives and our careers and our trajectories have, have, have gone really well. My only I'm bummed in the sense that we never got a chance to actually finish the project together. Right. Remember, I I left, and it's funny you mentioned Angelica Kitchen. Um, it was kind of we were brought down there under false pretenses. Mm -hmm. Like they basically wanted us to duplicate the Angelica yeah. Kitchen menu, like verbatim, and that was not the the uh, the impression I had when we went down there. Right. And so I just did not think that was ethical. And uh, we were a little disappointed because we wanted to, you know, this would have been our first, both of our, both Michael and myself would have been our first opportunity to open our own restaurant and kind of put our own pen stroke on, right. on you know, uh, creativity and things of that nature. Mm. So we walked and left a whole bunch of money on the table. I mean, we could have sued for the contract and everything. So mm. we didn't. Um but then, uh, unfortunately, we didn't get a chance to work with you directly. Yes. So, you know. Yes, but you've gone on to an amazingly successful career, obviously now with Good Catch, which is exploding and doing great. I'm leading the way in the plant-based seafood category. Yes. Um, just a true innovator, game changer. Um, the Sarno brothers, incredible. You want to talk about them for a second? Just a, I mean, they've done so much for this community and for this movement. It's, I just want to give them a, a, you know, a good applaud uh, for, for their efforts. Oh, absolutely. Jeff, just like I'm blessed to be friends with you. Like I met Chad um, 17 years ago and it was the same thing. It was like an instant click. Like you're my brother, he's my brother. What are, you know, what are we going to do? Um, and the fact that we were both chefs 
you know, we also communicated on, on that level too. So, um, yeah, Chad has always been, I just got off a call with him. He's, he's, he's a force of nature. That guy just is constant working, amazing ideas, amazing connections. So we had worked together for 17 years and I always joke around, like anytime I would pick up the phone and see his name, it would be like, Oh, it's going to be some other like kitchen impossible thing. Like <laughs> right. be on a plane like tomorrow. And like, I, I helped him open up a, a vegan restaurant in, in Munich. Mm. like a week's notice, you know, <laughs> nice. so, um, when he approached me about three years ago um, with this idea about vegan fish, the first thing was it just blew my mind. Cause I was like, no one was looking at that space, you know, it was beef, it was sausage. It was, right. you know, it was burgers. It was ground. Right. But, yeah. Right. I mean, now at Angelica, we used to do well, and maybe not Angelica, but there was a, it was a, a a traditional like you know the mashed chickpea tuna right right the mock tuna yeah mock tuna right and i created a pretty good one at uh when i was at uh, organic avenue it was all raw but it was like walnuts and dulse and lemon juice and all sorts of stuff it, it tasted great but it, you know it had this like pinkish hue you weren't fooling anybody you know <laughs> right so um so yeah and i think you know chad definitely led the way in that respect and then what's interesting, Derek was not, I think Derek's only been vegan maybe five years, but in that five years, mm. his impact has been uh, amazing. Um, I just happened to be in London doing some consulting work and he was there too. And this is when he was being offered the, the, to work with Tesco. Mm. And that opportunity, you know, is they're the largest food retailer in the world. Amazing that, yeah. we, that you could even say those two things in a sentence these days. Right. Remember, 23 years, 35 years ago, yeah. you know, I, I said, oh, this is going to catch on. And my brother laughed at me. He said, no, right. oh, you're never going to make any money doing plant-based. <laughs> right. Well, now, I mean, it's, and I think that's been the, at least from the food side, and I'd be interested to hear, because it's probably similar in, yes. in the area of sports nutrition, but the, the, the two big things I think that have allowed plant-based to explode the way it has from, the, from, from a food standpoint is uh, investment capital and companies oh, like Tesco nice. saying, like, we're going we're gonna to allocate this much money and right. we're going all in on plant-based. Like, for instance, and I'm sure the numbers have changed, but I think as of last year, six or 700 stores uh, throughout the United Kingdom, you can go in, in, into any Tesco. And there's anywhere between like 10 and 40 different vegan options, like grab and go, frozen pizzas, sauce kits, all these other kinds of things. So it's amazing. So that and then obviously food science coming into the, uh, the, yeah. the equation. It really, ha you know, it, if it wasn't for those two, the, the confluence of those two things, I don't think we'd be having these conversations. But it's... Um, yeah, the the my, my relationship with the with the Sonar Brothers has been a, a, an absolute blessing because now, and I'm sure you went through the same thing too before you started your own company. Yeah. It was not very easy when I when I first became vegan. I was working as a sous chef at a country club. I was making decent money. I had a 401k program, uh, health benefits, and everything else like that. And I went from making a really good salary to working at Angelica for like nine fifty an hour. And my my parents were like, can't you just cook the meat and like <laughs> eat it, you know? So so now come full circle, 23 years later, it's like now I'm working for an amazing company with amazing people, one of my dearest friends, and I'm making a living at it. So yeah. and yeah. you know, my career has kind of gone in in waves where, you know, I, I have prepared food like as a private chef which has been which is fun to a certain right. extent mm -hmm. but you know at the end of the week it's like i fed two people all week you know now <laughs> the opportunity with good catch yes. is not just here globally we have the we have the chance to really really move the needle and especially when you consider and it wasn't something that i really was aware i mean i i guess i, I had some awareness of it but it, the the numbers really didn't kick in um how much more we pull out of the sea just in terms of lives 
right. the, compared to land animals. Yeah. So it's um it's an amazing it's an amazing time. And we were talking about earlier. What was the what was the the uh, st the stat you told me about? Eighty percent, about one third. I just po I posted it not too long on social media uh, on my Facebook page. But about one third globally now have adopted their diet to transition towards to some degree, uh, whether flexitarian, vegetarian, vegan, or any of the different approaches in between. A third globally have changed their diet consciously, making a conscious effort to remove meat from their diet and add more plants. That's yeah. phenomenal. It is. <laughs> that it is, is so exciting. When you so actually when we when we met in '99, you had been vegan for how long? You would have been four. It years. was when about 15 years, about roughly. Wow. Yeah. I would be interviewing you. <laughs> we talk about the you know trying you know for for some of because you also mentioned too you were saying something like uh that we're i think we're at six percent now in the united states but yeah roughly percent of mm -hmm. those of that six percent has just recently become vegan in the last two years yes so another report saying 80 percent of those that have, are vegan right now today have done have become vegan within the last couple of years right and that that's amazing amount of growth that's one thing you can take away but also the takeaway is there's a lot of new people coming to this right so thank god that we have support like social media groups we have products almost in every category now that people can transition to. Right. And, and, you know, I know there's been a lot of blowback about processed foods and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But when you are talking about, okay, uh, anywhere between two and 6% of the U.S. population being vegan, that's not really what this part of the movement about. It's about reaching that other 94 to 98% of the people who are consuming animals, who are doing the heavy polluting of animal agriculture, the environmental impact, the suffering, the billions, trillions, if you're including fish, of right. animals dying every year. Third, an estimated one third of all the animals, especially it's even higher in fish, that actually get killed never even reach a table. They're right. thrown away as food waste. Right. I mean, that's an extraordinary amount of damage to our environment, damage to our health, and damage to and suffering caused for no reason whatsoever. Right. It, and and we need to focus on that other 98%, that other 94% of people, and they need products that are familiar to them. A right. lot of people won't change if it's too far out of their paradigm, out of their comfort zone. Absolutely. And we need these products. Yes, should people move to a whole food plant-based diet? Sure. But are you going to go from zero to raw? No, probably not. And that's not the majority of people. If it was, people would already be there. And it's right. not the case. Right. I think in our cases, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for you, but I'm sure that we were both, we both, well, first of all, we didn't have that, uh, that option, that luxury right. of, having, of, of having transitional food. But I think that we're the, the exception to the rule where it's like, hey, we see it. And we made the switch. I mean, I didn't even know. I mean, tofu was like, I didn't even know how to cook tofu. I'm embarrassed to say it's like I would buy the tofu and I cut it in half and just put like barbecue sauce on it. Right. Exactly. Right. Like as a chef, I'm embarrassed to say that. So <laughs> he made that switch without it. But you're right. Today, um, so much of this is like you said, it's for that 94%. Uh, someone was just, um, and it's someone, I don't know if you remember her from Florida, but she was starting to say like, Oh, the pl the products look great, but like, why are you calling it fish? Like, vegans mm -hmm. don't want like, you know, we're not in this because we want to eat fish. And I was trying to like gently say like, okay, first of all, I think it would be even more confusing to try to come up with some new kind of nomenclature. Like, right. oh, this is like pea based, flaky protein. You know what I'm saying? So it's based like, oceany. <laughs> right. You know, so, um, and then the other thing that I was trying to explain, which speaks to your point is like, we're trying to get that 94% on board to, tr to transition them. And a lot of them won't come over unless they have that, like you said, something that's why they, like Im impossible and beyond have exploded that way. And, right. and I yeah. know lots of people now that are really into that, you know, in, into that who are not vegan. So right. I, I, it's huge. And when I used to do the, the you know, veganizing, going into uh, carnivore restaurants, uh, you know, omnivore restaurants, 
you know, it was difficult for me because I had to just sit there and look the other way when they're like butchering fish and, and cutting meat and making right. jokes and stuff. But I can't tell you how many times, like there was this one place I, I, I made these, uh, it was a very simple recipe. Uh, temp, we call them tempeh wings. So it was uh, marinated tempeh. Uh, it was cooked and braised, and then we deep fried it, and then I tossed it in a in a buffalo sauce, and came up with this really good blue cheese um, sauce. And they used to serve it at the bar, and you know, invariably you have a lot of people, and people are drinking, and they're just like they they would see it on the menu, they see wings, and they just ordered it, and you know these big meat eating guys like oh these wings are great like let's get more of these it's like yeah but what is it? they're like boneless chicken and then the bartender would be like dude that's not even you know and we hooked them so that's that's a bit right. it, it, if i had to think of one that, that's one of my jobs i feel in or one of my paths in this life is like to make this food taste good enough that everyone is going to want to 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 make the switch and make it easy for them Right. And I, I, you know, I love the study that came out because people were saying, oh, uh, about Beyond Burger and Impossible Burger. And they did a study side by side uh -huh. of uh, its impact on health. And they found that they were much healthier than a meat based burger. So oh, I'm like, OK, if we can get a popular enough usage, it's going to bring the price down. If it, by, plants are cheaper, obviously, you're not paying for the plant and then feeding it to an animal and then uh, uh, gathering all those charges and costs. Right. as well you're starting out with just the plant instead of the whole process so it's going to be cheaper eventually right. when supply and demand catches up so cheaper healthier for you taste the same or better wow. what are you missing you're right. not missing anything you right. know and and obviously i'm on this side saying hey wait a minute at 57 yeah. if i can still do that then you're not missing anything right yeah. i've been vegan for 35 years and it can can maintain that kind of shape then Look, there is nothing you're missing. And as a matter of fact, what you're missing is the, uh, the sickness, the, the heart attacks, the diabetes, the stroke, the, right. the agricultural depletion of our lands, the uh, pollution, the, uh, all of that. Taxes. You know, most people don't get the connection that about 50 percent of our, our taxes go to health care. It's an extraordinary amount. And it's because people are eating a diet that makes them sick. That's what causes all health care to go up. That's what causes your taxes to go up. So when I hear people say, oh, I own my taxes lowered. OK, great. Start eating healthier. Start right. contributing to a lower tax base because we're not paying for the insurance that costs so much that's jacking up the, the health care costs. Make the connection. <laughs> because if you factor in the fact that um you know, uh, government subsidies for, for the meat and the dairy industries, like that's also coming out of your pocket. Exactly. So you remove you're that. For that. Right. You, you think, okay, meat's cheaper. No, no. You're paying for it in your taxes. Right. <laughs> you're just taking some of that cost and putting it over here so right. that you don't don't see it, don't notice that the cost is spread out. Right. Very true. Uh, and, and, and it's terrible because we're making the unhealthiest foods appear to be cheaper when they're not. Uh, they're more they're more expensive cost to our health. They're more expensive cost to our taxes. They're, uh, you know, to the to the the cost to the animal itself. So, right. Well, OK, so, you know, you and I are both animals for the uh, vegan for the animals, so ethical vegans. And so talk about your aha moment that made the light bulb come on for you. Right. And it's interesting, uh, the story, because it's it's connected with what I'm doing now with fish. So. Um, it was actually two moments, but the the one real big aha moment, the epiphany kind of thing, was um, uh, cleaning soft shell crabs. It was work. I was a sous chef at that country club, and it was soft shell crab season. And we never. Um, I I had cooked soft shell crabs before, but this was like when I was at the River Cafe in in New York, three star, beautiful, amazing restaurant right on the, uh, underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. They had a whole staff that did all the fish prep and everything else like that. So I was just cooking them. Um, so I was excited. Oh yeah, we got soft shell crab season and they came in alive and the chef's like, yeah, you got to clean them. And I was like, oh, okay. So like you take the soft, the, the crabs and they're alive and you have to like basically eviscerate them and take their lungs out and their eyeballs out. And they're trying to, trying to defend themselves. And I got through maybe half a dozen or so, maybe more. 
and I was I was more more focused on like, hey, I've got to make sure I'm doing this properly. So I was more focused on the the form and like and making sure I was doing it properly. But the whole time I was like, wow, this isn't this isn't right. And I was getting this this weird sensation up and down my spine, like I can't do this. And I went to the chef and I'm like, I can't do this. I was like, I'll do anything else you need me to do today. You know, and, and most people who don't know kitchen hierarchy, the sous chef doesn't go to the chef and say, right. <laughs> so that was the first thing that got me started thinking like, this is not, something's not right. And then uh, I, one of my specialties was being a saucier. So making all the sauces for the kitchen and for, for a large majority of sauces, um, you use what's called a veal, uh, veal gloss or a demi gloss. Mm-hmm. And it's basically slow roasted veal bones that you cook for 24 hours and then you take that stock and you reduce it for another 12 hours. And so every week I was doing, I was roasting off four or 500 pounds of veal bones. Mm -hmm. And one day after getting all the bones ready, I was just like, wow, each box is 50 pounds. I was like, how much is a calf weigh? And I remember asking the chef and he was like, why, you know, we're, we're busy in the restaurant. We're, you know, trying to get stuff done. And he's like, why do you need to know this right now? And I was like, I don't know. I was like, this is fr- flipping me out. I was like, how much is a calf weigh? I'm like, I, every day, every, you know, every week I'm, I'm just roasting these bones off. And it wasn't long after that, Jeff, that I was like, I can't do this anymore. And that was it. I, I left, um, I left the country club and I ended up coming, uh, I became vegan. And after six months, I went back to the country club and worked but I didn't taste the thing. And that's when I knew that I wasn't going to be able to stay as a regular chef because I wasn't, I, first of all, I was, I didn't even want to be around it, but then I wasn't able to taste it. So I was like, I'm not even being true to my craft at this point. Right. So that was it. And then I didn't even know there were vegan restaurants to be honest. Um, and it was weird. Cause like I lived in Westchester, which is right outside of Manhattan, which is outside of, well, back then outside of LA, it was, a, you know, vegan Mecca. It was the Mecca. Yeah, it was. Fortunately, I had a good friend of mine, this guy, Jim Delfino, who I'm still very close with. He and I worked at the river cafe together and he was, he was vegetarian or vegan at the time. And he was like, Hey, let's, you know, let's pick some places out. You know, the, he, he said, in the, it was in the Zagat's Guide. Mm-hmm. Go on the Zagat's Guide and pull up, pull up some places. And fortunately, I ended up uh, finding Angelica Kitchen and fell in love with it. And then, you know, it just took off from there. So, so that was your first vegan gig, then, right? Angelica Kitchen, yeah. And they almost didn't hire me because I, I you know, I had gone in a few times and I just loved the place. And uh, and it's funny too. Like the, I had a waitress there who I was like, I mean, I fell in love with her immediately. And I was like, I would always go back to see like, oh, maybe she's there. But then every time you'd go, there'd always be a celebrity there. So I was like, wow, this place is like, it's great food, great wait staff. And I was like, and there's all these famous people coming. So I actually, when I applied, they almost didn't hire me because they had never seen anybody with a, uh, with an actual culinary degree. And so they're very skeptical, which was like, I don't know what you, I mean, I'm here to spy or something. I I don't know. So fortunately they took a chance on me and um, it was a little difficult. I have this one embarrassing story where the chef told me, Peter Burley, who was an amazing chef, not vegan, but taught me everything I needed to know about, uh, about preparing vegan food. And he says, go downstairs and get the tempeh uh, because uh, I was going to do a tempeh dish that day. So I go downstairs in the walk, and we had this amazing tempeh from a local place. I uh, can't remember the name. Cricklewood, I want to say. But from, from a local place in, in Pennsylvania. They made it all fresh. Wow. So I go down there, open up the box, and I take one package out, and it's got all this, like, mold on it. I was like, oh. So I'm going through all that case. I put that case back. <laughs> I go through, like, seven or eight of the cases. I come back up with nothing. And Peter's like, Where, where's the tempeh? And I'm like. Chef, I got news for you. I was like, it's all, it's all spoiled. It's all bad. It's like, Dude, that's part of the thing. And I was like, okay, <laughs> lesson learned. Uh, so it, it's been, it's been quite a, it's funny to look back on that now um, just to see where, you know, where I'm at at this point, but it's, it's and been, now like it went fermented foods is exploding right now. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and it's fun. It's, it's, good that people are really starting to understand gut health and 
why plants and fiber foods are so important to our health. Right. Um, that's it's it's great to see so much of the education. You know, you got uh, people like Dr. Greger and many of the vegan doctors out there really pushing the science and and the health. You know, you've got food companies like you that you're working with that are doing an amazing job, especially with the oceans. We're about to cause the you know the sixth great extinction of life in the oceans right now. We're fast pace heading there very quickly wiping out over 50 percent of all the life in the ocean already in the last 40 years it's just astounding at the pace we are just destroying life um and uh so i mean and then you got the plastics in the ocean and the garbage and the plasticizers that are now showing up in human organs uh, right. from people eating fish they had a study out of the uk that showed an average person eating fish and seafood once a week for a year had over a thousand pieces of microplastics lodged in their tissues. Wow! Right. So that I mean that, that right there is the is the for me when it, because you you mentioned like the processed food. Yeah. I'll take that any day over mercury, microplastics, all these other all these other problems that are that are you know in in fish. Um, yeah, the the scale the scale of it with you know I mean when you're casting a net that is a mile wide a mile just think of that you know and like you said all the all the other all the other fish that are caught uh, accidentally yeah you know that, that end up just getting you know killed and not used fish and mammals too I mean right dolphins right that whole thing I remember this it was probably the 70s or maybe the early 80s when they had dolphin safe tuna, tuna. Right. you know. Um, and that's another reason why I'm just thrilled to be working with good catches. That tuna fish was one of my favorite things to eat. Mm -hmm. I, think I ate it every day for four years in college. <laughs> right. Well, it was cheap, sixty-nine cents a can back then. I mean, that's uh... right. It was the first <laughs> yeah. thing my mom taught me how to make. So as a as a kid, it was like, here's a can opener. This is a can of tuna. Here's the mayonnaise. It was, yeah. it was literally the first thing I ever made. And that's that's the first thing like I made from my mom one day. Um, and I think that also actually helped me. I mean, there are no, there are no mistakes, right? There's no coincidences. Right. I remember making tuna salad one day for my mom. We had been to a, um, uh, it was called Lord and Taylor's. It's a department store and they right. had a cafe in there yeah. and they used to serve tuna in a, uh, in a hollowed out tomato. And I remember we, I would, I went there for lunch with my mom once I couldn't have been more than 10. Yeah. 10 or yeah. 10 or 11. And I saw how much he liked the tuna, whatever. So one day I did that in my house. And I, I mean, I wish I had a picture of it because it probably looked all gnarly and, ever, you know, but I did it and I served it to my mom. And like, I got that immediate feedback and like, I wish I was expressing my love and it was received. And that is, if I had to look at an aha moment for why I became a chef, that mm -hmm. is certainly something to point back to. So the fact that it was tuna fish that I was making Mm. Um, you know, again, there's no, there are no coincidences, but it's pretty cool when you, when you yeah. Yeah, come, come full circle. And, right. and, and I think the same reason, like, like I got into nutrition, uh, the field of nutrition, been working on it like you for 30 years. Right. Uh, and right. Is, is it, is it give back, you know, it's a way right. to feed people, to nourish people, to give something that they can enjoy. And, right. and it's, and for those of us in the healing arts, the fitness, the nutrition, the food comp, these are all places where we're giving life to other people, but we got to do it in a way that is sustainable. We have to right. do it in a way that doesn't negatively impact our health. You know, this is not uh, just a conversation about, um, you know, the, 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 the veganism is, is, is the approach and that every house to do it. I, I'm, interested in having people be empowered live a healthy help happy life and do so in a way that positively impacts everything around us and when you can make a choice that's that simple why would you not want to do that i mean it, this should not be an us versus them a right versus wrong argument this should be duh this is the right obvious thing right. to do it's it's good for you it's good for the environment it's good for everybody else too and it's good for the animals why would you not want to do all that goodness i mean it's 
<laughs> it's, it's cognitive dissonance. I mean, you're right. It has become a, a an, an us versus them. And what's interesting, because I'm sure you went through it as well as most like newly minted vegans do, is that um, we become like the the newly minted vegans are the ones who are um, they're the aggressors. Like you know, it's us mm -hmm. against them kind of thing. But I've kind of seen it now, especially that veganism is gaining popularity. Sometimes I see it coming in the other direction, where it's like you have people who get, you know, when, when you start presenting the, the, uh, all these new plant-based things, it kind of gets their, you know, their defenses up, like you're mm -hmm. challenging their lifestyle. Right. Um, right. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of work to be done. But I think that it, you know, it, it is it is a challenge, no doubt. But it should be a positive challenge, just like if you're challenged in a sport to, to perform better. Well, when well, you I, do, victory, you know, it feels great. Well, I, you I should be challenged. Right. <laughs> Like, you know, we do the food shows and hopefully we'll get back to a point where we're doing the food shows again. Yes. So many people come up to the booth and they're so skeptical. And, you know, we just we just kill them with kindness and then we present them with the food. And then sure enough, I can't tell you, you know, an exact percentage, but so many people who were skeptical or making fun of it or making jokes, they end up bringing other people back to the booth. Like the next day, they're like, you gotta try this. You gotta try this. And all of a sudden, <laughs> working for us like hey you're on the part you're part of the marketing team now. Like yesterday, you were like you didn't want any anything to do with us you know totally so it, i love the challenge you know and you're in the same boat you know yeah. i mean i'm sure when you started out and probably even you know especially when you're in the gym with people who aren't vegan you know yeah. these massive tubs of whey and stuff like that and here you're telling them like yeah i can do this without whey try this you know right. and again it's the same thing it, you check off all the boxes Right. Less expensive, better for the environment, better for you, blah, 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 blah. Why wouldn't you try clean machine instead of right. whatever that, you, you know, whatever they're buying, you know? Well, and, and it's it's weird when you talk about cognitive dissonance, because I see people so great. And look, I get there's a cultural thing, right? Um, right. No one wants to be ostracized. No one wants to be the weird person out, right? Right. Uh, well, not no one. I did. I didn't mind. Yeah, I, did. <laughs> you know, I was that weird guy. I was the guy that that, that had a tofu sandwich at his desk while everybody else had their uh, typical American uh, standard American diet. But um, but no, I, I get that part of the equation. But that's why I think it's so important when you can have foods that people can't even tell the difference between. Right. It allows for some social normalization. It allows right. for people to say, hey, wait, I can make a choice and I'm not going to get looked at weird. People may not even know the difference, you know. And I, if I don't know and I feel better and I feel healthy about it, why not? That opens up the social because I think there's a really big social part of this equation that a lot of people have, have trouble with. And when you that that defensive mechanism that kicks in for so many people, I think it's not that you're going to take away their food because the food replacements are getting so good right now. You're swapping. It's like. OK, you know, I'm not really giving up anything. I still have my ice cream. I still have my pizza. I still have my burgers and hot dogs. This, I'm not, what did I give up? You know, right. nothing. Right. But that social element, oh, you're eating something different. Why are you doing that? That's when they get defensive, I feel, is that, hey, wait a minute. You know, now I'm going to be ostracized from my friends. Oh, we don't want to eat with you. I don't want to go out to dinner with you because you have to get something to that social element we need to tackle and address more. I think the the mock foods and the replacements, the alternative proteins category is really helping a lot more with that social, especially now that we're seeing Burger King and Kentucky Fried Chicken. That I think is going to normalize socially a lot more of what we're seeing. And, you know, the, the World Vegan Bodybuilding Championship, right? Right. We had 50 people on stage with amazing physiques, male and female. Right. All vegan. Right. And people were saying, they're all vegan? Because we held it at Veg Fest, which is a lot of omnivores attending it, probably right. 50, 60% omnivores. And they're all like, those are all vegan? Really? You know, yeah. it was mind blowing for him. So that normalization, I think, is 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 a big part of this next phase of the movement. And when I say movement, I mean inclusive. I mean 
Right. Everybody out here who's omnivore, it's about you empowering yourself to make healthier decisions for you, for your environment, for the things you care about. You know, I was in a, a gym and I was talking to the guy and he was like, can you talk with me a little bit about it? Because I've been curious about it. But what about the protein? And of course, I talked to all that kind of stuff. But I said, all right, do me a favor. I said, you have kids? He goes, yeah, two girls, six and ten. And I said, okay, close your eyes and picture looking right in their eyes and telling them, daddy prefers to eat this hamburger, even though it'll give me a heart attack and I won't be around to see you grow up. Look into their eyes and tell them that you're choosing that hamburger over being there for their graduation, being right. there for their college, being there for when they have a kid, that you are gonna miss out because that burger is more important to you. Right. Can you look in your eyes, her eyes and tell her that? He started welling up. I mean, this is a big 200 pound, you know, guy. Right. <laughs> and he's like, wow. He was so choked up, he couldn't talk anymore. He goes, I gotta get back to work. That wow. stirred him. And, right. and I think, my God, if we just get in touch with the things we love and care about and start there. Right. I mean, like that moment you had with connecting with a crab. Right. You're like, this is wrong. Right. <laughs> you know, I think we can all have those moments if we let ourselves. But um, it is, you know, it's not giving up anything. There's so much good stuff out there right now. I mean, when you and I, 35 years ago, I had three choices. 35. So this is 19 1985. Yeah. Wow. So in 1985, I had the choice between sawdust, leather, or wood. You know, those are my basic things. Right. The basic cardboard, right? Those were what the, the food products taste. Well, like. Eden Foods was around then, right? Eden was, yeah. They had two. Uh, Light Life. What's that? Light Life was around. Uh, Light Life came later, but yeah, but roughly around that time, I think. Okay. Um, and what I didn't know, only now because we've worked with them a lot over the last couple of years, uh, Follow Your Heart is forty years uh, was is forty two years old now, forty one. Absolutely, they're there yet in L.A. Amazing, completely right. vegan since, and now they're doing their whole product line. They started out just the store. Right. Remember back then, you would take a plastic uh, bag, invert it, and stick your hand into a bucket with floating cubes of tofu. Really? That's how you got your tofu. And then you pull your hand out and close up the bag and then take it to the register. That's how you got your tofu. Wait, at that place or are you talking about anywhere? Right? It, was a, it was the very first um, uh, yeah. health food store that I worked at oh. way back then. And that was in Florida? That was in uh, just outside of DT, uh, DC, Washington, DC, oh. Old, Town, Old Town, Virginia. Gotcha. Yeah. So it was a tiny little, little health food store called Cash Grocer, probably less than 500 square feet. Wow. And, you know, had the sprouts, had the tofu. Had <laughs> I think I remember I was so excited because well, I was making pizzas, right? My pizza was take a whole wheat pita, pour some pasta sauce on it, and then sprinkle nooch, right? Nutrition. Right, right. Yeah. That was my That's pizza. Fair. Right. <laughs> we made it a little easier. Yes. No, it's 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 so cool. And you know, you you, you mentioned social media too. I, I would say that's the third thing that's really helped things explode. Like I was, I I, I forgot where yeah, I saw totally. the interview. What's that? Yeah, totally. I totally. Oh, yeah. The other day, um, she's really great, Tabitha Brown. Mm. Okay. Um, I I don't know. I don't know if I follow her here, but on Instagram, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think she just said the other day she posted something. It was like. A flashback from when she became vegan and it was like three years ago so it's like you look at the impact that she's had just in three years because of social media it's like it reaches all corners of the planet and it's immediate so that that's definitely the, the other thing i would say that has has really helped our numbers grow uh, exponentially and and again, when I say our, I'm looking for the inclusion. You know, I, I guess maybe, you know, maybe in the beginning it was kind of cool, you know, when you became vegan because it was like you were part of this club. Yeah. You know, very it was a pretty club. elite club, too. Right. <laughs> now it's like you want everyone to be in that club. You, know? right. you don't want it yeah. to be a club. You don't want there to yeah. be this kind of, you know, oh, well, we're, you know, um, 
and I'm sure there's still vegans who are like that. They, you know, they, they cop this kind of moral superiority thing. Whereas mm -hmm. I just look at it like I'm, I've, I feel blessed that I got to this point when I did, mm -hmm. you know, as far as just like having my eyes opened and things like that. And it's just like, everyone's at a different spot. So it's like, you, you kind of touched on it earlier. It's like, it's our job to help everyone along. Right. Instead of looking at that person as an adversary, say like, right. how can I help you? You know? Right. right. So, yeah. And, and social media, having some real research that backs up what we have intuitively known and have from a heart space known in right. our heart of hearts, this is wrong. Now we see how it literally is negatively impacting. Our microbiome is destroyed by eating animal products right. and it sustains our life. You look at COVID right now, uh, COVID, the, one of the biggest parts of people dying from COVID is an uh, improper immune response. And what lowers that, what the cytokine storms, which is once it attacks our lungs, our body tries to do it with the innate uh, immune response. And then we create a whole bunch of cytokines, which just destroy everything and create damage so much that we actually damage ourselves, fill our lungs up with fluid, and we can die from our own immune response. Immune response, right. Because the adaptive oh. immune response, right. exactly, that should come down and suppress that inflammation yeah. is not there because people aren't eating fiber. And right. I'm like, all right, so fiber only comes from plants. Plants with fiber feed the microbiome. They turn it into short-chain fatty acids called butyrates. And that actually is known to be kept in the lungs along with vitamin C, zinc, a few other, and suppresses that immune system to right. keep people. People are dying from nutrition-caused symptoms. Most people should be able to survive COVID. The right. people that are dying are because of pre-existing conditions caused by diet or poor immune function caused by diet. I right. mean, it's like, why I mean, are we not that's saying why that? people. That's why you're seeing people of all ages uh, being, you know, uh, afflicted with, with uh, you know. Even, even infants and, and children now. Right. I mean, yeah. You know. And, you know, I look at one of the um, inflammatory responses that children are getting is where their whole immune system just goes flush. Their skin can turn into blisters and, 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 and hives and stuff like that. And it's their immune just going wild. It's an autoimmune function. And then you look at the amount of antibiotics used on children. Right. What does an antibiotic do? It wipes out all your probiotics. Right. Your gut. Then the probiotics can't produce the immune or inflammatory suppressing or calming right and there you have it an overactive of inflammation with no way to bring down that inflammation because you just knocked out the microbiome with, with antibiotics right. I'm like oh my god right it's a, it's a vicious cycle it, it just you know it's uh yeah it's terrible so are you guys going to come out with a, a probiotic uh we are we're, we stay focused on the prebiotics because okay. for, for me uh Probiotics, when you look at probiotics, like eight to 10 billion, right? Well, there's 40 trillion probiotics. In our right. So that's like, uh, you know, a fraction of 1%. Um, yes, there's there's been good research on certain probiotics for therapeutic reasons. But look, if you just feed them the proper fiber and prebiotics, you'll right. feed all 40 trillion of them, all 400 strains, not just yeah. one, two, three, or 10 strains. Right, right. You know, and that makes sense. Feed everyone and everyone, uh, you know, does well. And of right. course, on the flip side is when you put animal products in there and it creates a bile environment and that produces putrazines and cadaverines that are toxic and can lead to colon cancer and actually kill off and suppress uh, our good probiotics. It's really clear which of those two um, we should be eating from. I mean, if you just know anything about pro the, your, your internal gut floor, it's really clear. These guys feed on fiber, only comes from plants. The bad guys, they feed on animal proteins. Right. <laughs> they have it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's why, that's why I think so much of this, uh, the recent science, as well as social media, being able to spread some of this science and research is making people realize, hey, wait a minute, this is, this should just be common sense. Right. You know, it's it's right on every level. It's not an us and them. It's not a right or wrong. It's not a politic. It's not a tribal. 
it's not. It's it's common sense health right. that empowers everyone. It's good for everyone. Right. Um, and, and economically, we have to move to a more plant-based diet. It's not sustainable. Right. Uh, and and that's why I love what you're doing with uh, uh, with Good Catch because thank you. You know, people I've told people like, all right, we're about to wipe out all life in the ocean. They say, okay, big deal. We don't eat fish anymore. And I'm like, no, you don't understand how that works. Yeah. <laughs> there is a, the butterfly effect here. And, and when the fish die, uh, the plants overpopulate. And when they do that, when they die, they pull all the oxygen out of the ocean. And when they do that, they kill all the plants. 80% of the oxygen you and I are breathing right now comes from those plants right. in the ocean. Yeah not the amazon the rainforest barely has an equal cycle of the amount of oxygen produced to the actual animals that live there that's not where the oxygen coming from it's not trees sorry to burst people's bubbles it's right. coming from the oceans right. we wipe out the fish we tip that balance it's going to wipe out most of the animal life on the planet including humans right. that's that's apocalyptic and that's why it's so important <laughs> Right. It comes by, it comes down to, you know, and it's, it sounds kind of new agey and hokey. And, and a lot of times people, you know, use it as a, almost a dismissive thing, but we really all are one. Yes. You know, I think if, I think the more we, I mean, it, it's come out of the black lives matter, you know, uh, movement where it's like, we have, we need to wake up. It's like, we are all one. We're all from the same material. And um, until we start respecting everyone and realizing that, and like you said, the butterfly effect, it's like, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's interesting. It's a, it's a tipping point right now. And to see the kind of growth gives me a lot of hope and to, and to see the amount of innovation, the amount of, uh, like you said in the, the beginning of it, the amount of money that's coming in, the amount of big players that are coming in to participate in this. They see the growth, they see the future trend, and, and right. this is where it's moving. So, you know, for those of you out there who are uh, listening and are sitting on the fence or questioning, please reach out with questions. Pete's a great resource, another long timer. So how can people reach out to you and, and get in touch with you? Um, you can re reach me here on, on Facebook or Instagram, Pete's, uh, Peter Savoni, um, at Peter Savoni. Um, and hopefully, again, when we start doing these food shows, I mean, I would certainly encourage people who are who don't know about this to find like when we start doing um, trade shows again and when we start doing festivals like I miss, you know, not doing seed, um, which was always amazing. Uh, so, you know, go to those things. I mean, that's where you're going to. I mean, aside from seeing things on, uh, on on social media and listening to videos and watching things, to be ac actually able to go out to these places where you're interacting with people, you're trying the food, um, the, you're you're actually having conversations with people and learning things. I mean that. I mean before before these kind of these massive trade shows and all these amazing festivals, which I would love to be able to go to all of them, but sometimes mm -hmm. you just can't. You know, before that, it was like. Angelica Kitchen was the only place to go, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and uh, uh, other restaurants, obviously, in Manhattan, but like, unless you were at Angelica Kitchen, you weren't getting that kind of, I mean, it, it was more than just, mm -hmm. yeah, so, um, yeah, but I'm, I'm always here, and I love to, I love to interact with people, and so, you know, any questions, it would, it, you know, I'm, I'm always here for, for that, so. And check um, out. Yeah, definitely check out Good Catch too. Uh, so the products are amazing. They've got new stuff coming out all the time. So keep posted on their website, uh, GoodCatchFoods.com. GoodCatchFoods.com. Yeah, and we have a, we're, we're we have a pretty robust um, a section for recipes. So it's uh, and that and that obviously is my passion. So it's a lot of fun to do that, and we're trying to do more of them as well. Um, and then we also have our frozen line coming out, which is very exciting. It's already. It's been launched on the East Coast, and the rollout should be uh, national very soon. So that's crab cakes, fish, uh, Thai fish cakes, fish burgers, and it really just takes things to the to the next level. And, you know, instead of just uh, instead of just tuna. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's great. That's great stuff. More accessibility to more people to 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 reach and to have alternatives um, to the animal products out there. 
Love you, brother. Thank you for everything you're doing, man. Thank you so much. And you too. Yeah, it's. I'm happy that we met on this path um, 20 plus years ago and we're still on it and moving forward and, and doing really well. So thank you. Thank you, brother. Great having you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.